Thank you all very much uh, for coming out this morning. And what uh, I kind of want to do this morning is something that I've done in Vermont a whole lot of times, and that is do an informal discussion dealing with reality. You ready for reality? So I was watching TV at the hotel this morning, and they had a segment on Mrs. Mnuchin, who is the wife of the Secretary of Treasury, was defending herself in terms of the designer clothing that she has purchased. Now, I kind of think that's probably not the major issue facing the American people. What do you think? All right. So I think, and we see that all of the time. So what we try to do is bring a dose of truth and reality to what goes on in our country. And today I'm very pleased to have a wonderful panel of people who are going to be talking about issues that you may not see on the TV every night, and some of them may be painful, but they are realities that impact not just this county and this state, but my state uh, and every state in this country. In other words, the bottom line is that we have a nation in which a lot of people are hurting. And we're not going to be able to address that hurt and that pain unless we bring those issues out. And it's not easy. What these guys are going to do today is not easy. They're going to be talking about some very personal issues, which a lot of people choose not to talk about. So what I want to do is hear from them, and I think you want to hear from them. Uh, I'll chat for a little bit, and then we'll just open it up for comments and discussion. Uh, so let's begin with... Um, Andrew Walker. Andrew, thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you, Senator, for your introduction. Uh, good morning. My name is obviously Andrew Walker. I'm a political science major here at Shawnee, and I've lived in southern Ohio all of my life. But attending this university has opened my eyes to how hard it really is to get by as a full-time student. We're under constant stress. We may or may not have an employer who's willing to work around our class schedules. And after four years and many, many late nights, we're, there's still no guarantee that we'll have, uh, have the opportunity to find a job in our chosen field. Students attend college to make a better life for ourselves and others, but the rising cost of tuition has made it harder for the majority of Americans, like you and me. And the average cost of tuition in 1974 was $3,860. At that time, for that amount, you could buy a brand new Chevy Bel Air and still have money left over. <laughs> Unfortunately, as tuition costs have risen, so has the cost of living and pretty much everything else but the minimum wage hasn't gone up at the same rate. In the 70s and 80s, a student could work part-time and still mostly afford to pay for their classes. Today, a student would have to work over 90 hours a week in addition to attending school full-time to pay for their tuition out of pocket, which is frankly ridiculous. My generation isn't asking for a handout. We're asking for help so that we can get the training, the education, and the experience to get into the workforce so we can help ourselves, our families, and our communities. Now, my mother is sitting in the audience today. Hi. <laughs> uh, through her schooling, she has racked up over $80,000 in debt. Uh, she used to joke that the only way she'd be able to pay off that loan was if she became disabled or died. Uh, she never expected that just a few months after she finally got her registered nursing license, uh, she would be diagnosed with kidney cancer that had metastasized to her spine. Thankfully, we have TRICARE, which is military insurance, because of my father's 20 years of naval service. Without that insurance, we never would have been able to afford her treatments, just one of which cost over $7,000 for a little bottle of pills. 
On top of that, our family still has an almost $20,000 copay to take care of. Today, mom is considered 100% disabled. She'll never work as a nurse again, but her experience has taught her and myself that government health care isn't perfect, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Andrew. And if you listen carefully to what Andrew discussed in just a, just a few minutes, this is what he talked about. He talked about the high cost of college, the fact that his mother left school deeply in debt, and the reality is that millions of people in this country today have very high levels of student debt. He talked about jobs and the need to create jobs that pay a decent wage and that too many jobs are paying minimum wage, which people cannot live upon. He talked about health insurance and how government health insurance has worked for his family. He talked about the high cost of prescription drugs. That is what he talked about in three minutes. All right? And those are just some of the issues that we as a community and as a people have got to address. So, Andrew, thank you very much for raising those issues. Now we're going to hear from Summer Kirby, who is the CEO of the Community Health Center. Summer. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, I just wanted to kind of first highlight, I'm a native resident, and I moved away to Columbus to go to college, um, where I completed my undergraduate degree while working full time. And my husband and I moved back home from the Dayton area, which we re relocated with our family when we had our first child. Portsmouth is home. Our family is here. It is our home. So we were thrilled to come back to Portsmouth. After about 15 years in the financial industry and volunteering with various organizations in our community, my path transitioned and it led me to Compass Community Health. Since that time, my perspectives, my understanding has changed. Healthcare, specifically the Affordable Health Care Act, substance abuse, are two commonly misunderstood topics. Issues extend beyond the party lines. They impact all the constituents. In small communities like our own, it doesn't matter if someone's education, their upbringing, or your religion. Medicaid expansion was, is, and continues to be a significant impact in communities all across Ohio and the United States. While we are in the center of the opiate epidemic, we are not unlike any other communities. Expansion enables access for services such as primary care, mental health, recovery services, and general health care needs. Common practice is to connect with individuals who've never had access to health care in their life. These are reasons that also Im impact unemployment. It impacts addiction. It impacts the urgent cares and the emergency rooms serving as a primary care provider for individuals in our communities. Improvements have been and continue to be made under the Medicaid expansion. Some of those highlights that I'd like to mention today are specifically here for our community. The Counseling Center is a 35-year-old drug and alcohol treatment facility. Because of Medicaid expansion, they've been able to serve 1,100 men in their mid-20s. That's 1,100 men that wouldn't have had access to any sort of treatment or any sort of health care had it not been for Medicaid expansion. Um, the same organization has attributed and been able to be a positive force in women who are pregnant. They have also reported 245 births of drug free born babies. That's a huge. There's also a provider that speaks of his patient who lost her job due to the economic downturn, finding herself for the very first time unemployed in her life. As a diabetic, she ended up in the emergency room with complications of her diabetes. As a result of Medicaid expansion, she now has had access to health care and her diabetes are controlled. Employed individuals need access to health care, and Medicaid expansion is one vehicle that employed individuals are able to access health care. Cost and economics and sustainability of the program are core components of this discussion. One of the commonly overlooked topics is the economic growth that Medicaid expansion has. So Medicaid expansion in our health care facility has enabled 
additional services, access to primary care providers, which is a challenge for people in rural areas. It's enabled us to hire additional providers, mental health staff, administrative staff, and clinical staff. The organization I previously noted has added 67 jobs and equates to $2.3 million in additional payroll to our community. So Medicaid expansion is a huge economic factor. These are just some of the few examples of the investments that Medicaid expansion has had. These dollars invest in support in our community. They bring goods and services to our community. They've helped individuals reach out and obtain higher education and degrees. So simply put, it is a very complex equation. It's one that you have to look at not just from the cost of health care, but the full continuum of care. At my health center, we are federally bound by law and our mission to serve anyone regardless of their insurance source. We are fully focused on integrated health care, where we take an individual who's primary care and work with their mental health provider, work with you know, the pharmacist, and really take a look at that individual as a whole package of care to be able to help their address their medical needs. So I appreciate you coming to our community today to listen to the realities that we face every day. Thank you. Summer, thanks very much. Uh, Summer is part of what we call a federally qualified community health center, FQHCs, and I work very hard on those, uh, helping to double the funding of them. And what they do, and they address a real problem in our country, is that in many parts of America, even if you have decent health insurance, you can't gain access to a doctor or a dentist or mental health counseling or low-cost prescription drugs. And that is exactly what FQHCs do. Uh, some raise the very important issue about Medicaid expansion, something you have done here in the state of Ohio, and Kentucky has done it as well. Many states have not. Question that I want you all to think about. There was a series of bills that Republicans brought forth over the last several months. All of them would have made massive cuts in Medicaid to the tune of some $800 billion. Some of them would have thrown 32 million people off of the health insurance they have, another one 23 million, another one 22 million question that we have got to ask, and we can discuss it in a moment. Why is it that the United States of America is the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people? All right. Now, I live in Burlington, Vermont. We're 50 miles away from the Canadian Border. For decades, in Canada, every man, woman, and child has been guaranteed health care as a right. They spend about 50% per capita on health care compared to what we spend. So the questions that we have got to ask ourselves in communities like this and all over America, number one, should health care be a right? Number two, if it is, how do we develop a cost-effective health care system which guarantees health care to all people? Uh, let me... Uh, some are also mentioned a crisis that exists in Ohio, Kentucky, in the state of Vermont, in New Hampshire, virtually all over this country. And I hope we can have some discussion on that as well. And that is the opioid crisis. We are losing uh, in this nation now over 60,000 people every single year from drug overdoses. That's opioids, heroin, uh, etc. Why are so many people succumbing to drugs? How do we prevent it? How do we treat it? I hope we can talk about that as well. Uh, let's welcome now Lisa Mowry, who's a counselor at the Shawnee State Mental Health I'm proud and honored to be here today. 
I'm a clinical counselor and I'm an alumnus from Shawnee State University. I've been in the field of mental, mental health for over 20 years and I've seen many changes during that time. I began my internship at Shawnee Mental Health Center and River Valley Behavioral Health here in Portsmouth. Since then, I've worked with Children's Services and Scioto County Board of DD, and I served on the board at the Counseling Center very proudly. Currently, I'm in private practice, and I contract with Scioto County Probate and Juvenile Court for adoption assessment and guardianship investigations. My experience with mental health services began in my early 20s, working at Comprehensive Care, a mental health center in Lexington, Kentucky, where my husband was attending UK Law School. There I witnessed the impact that a therapist can make on the quality of life for children and adults. I did, however, not get to follow that calling immediately as our children came along and my husband's career started to take off. But once my kids were in school, I came back to college at Shawnee and I've never looked back. I feel like I found my purpose working with people through my capacity as a mental health counselor. As I mentioned, mental health has changed so much since I started practicing. It was once a big secret that no one wanted to talk about. Today, mental health has come out of the shadows and more and more people are willing to seek help. That's why I think today is important. The Affordable Care Act and Ohio Medicaid expansion have been a big game changer for so many. In Scioto County in the first year, 5,300 people enrolled in insurance coverage. Significant, significantly, people could seek drug and alcohol treatment and mental health treatment. Many of my clients rely on ACA to meet their medical and behavioral health needs. We cannot afford to go back to anything less than ACA. We must keep moving forward. Here in Scioto County, our challenges are great, but every day I'm heartened by our leaders and our community who are and the changes that they are working to implement. In my field, we continue to need so many more counselors to work with children and to work with families. I'm proud to be here with Senator Bernie Sanders today as he has strongly stood in support of quality health care and education for all Americans. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for all your good works, and thank you for coming to Portsmouth today. I hope, uh, thank you um, very much, Lisa. And I hope one of the questions uh, that we can discuss, because it bothers me immensely, it's a problem in my state and all over this country, is why do so many people turn to drugs? Why? I mean, we, I think we'll all end up agreeing we need to put more emphasis and resources into prevention, we we'll need to put more emphasis into treatment, and we're not doing a particularly good job on that. But why? Why is there such a need for drugs in this country? And I hope we can discuss that. But Lisa, thank you very much for the work you're doing. It's enormously important. And now let's hear from Zach Holbrook. Zach? Um, mine's a little more like story time than a professionally prepared speech, but uh, I just kind of wanted to give everybody an insight to the struggles that my wife and I face as special needs parents. Um, on November 19th, 2014, my wife, Elizabeth, and I uh, were blessed to welcome our daughter, Autumn Jane, into the world. Um, as blissful as that may have seemed at first, it wasn't without complication. Uh, she struggled in her first hours of life, uh, but the problems eventually subsided, and we were discharged uh, in a pretty reasonable amount of time. Um, however, less than 24 hours at home uh, while nursing, my daughter went into cardiac arrest. Um, we had lost her for at least 20 minutes. She had no pulse, which meant no oxygen or blood to her brain. Um, took three rounds of epinephrine to finally get her back, and she was back, but she was not the same child that she was just an hour prior. She was diagnosed with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Uh, as time went by, we would also receive diagnoses of epilepsy and cerebral palsy. She's nonverbal, nonambulatory, tube-fed, and legally blind. She's 100% dependent on my wife and I. 
Uh, We made just enough money to consider ourselves lower middle class, but we were still struggling because of our student debt. Uh, Care for Autumn was hard to come by. She's no cakewalk by any means. Uh, And my wife was having to routinely miss work to take her to her appointments at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, We decided the best thing for our family was for Elizabeth to leave her job and care for Autumn full time. We lost our health insurance through my wife's job, unfortunately. We were reduced to living off of my $9 an hour income. Fortunately, Autumn's diagnoses led to her qualification for SSI disability, so that helped a bit, but not much. Um, We were forced to file bankruptcy just to tread water. Uh, The most frustrating part is how our income affects Autumn's coverage. She needs Medicaid. It's hard to imagine even an upper middle class family being able to afford her needs. She requires a specialized wheelchair, price tag $11,000. Since January, her pharmacist ran a report for me. Uh, He's billed over $13,000 to Medicaid just for her medications to keep her alive. Uh, We mistakenly received a bill for her initial life flight, $45,000. Fortunately, Medicaid picked that up. Um, We constantly receive scares anytime we talk about trying to better our family and my wife returning to work. Um, Our measly $42,000 a year was above the threshold, and they wanted to take Autumn's care away. So uh, we were granted a full-time in-home nurse, so that's been a blessing. Um, But if she returns to work to reduce our financial strain, then we could potentially lose Autumn's coverage. We would lose our nurse, and Elizabeth would be right back home caring for Autumn again. It's like a vicious cycle. Um, Autumn's currently on the waiting list for a Medicaid waiver that would guarantee her coverage based on her diagnoses, not upon my income or my wife's income, all thanks to Ohio's Medicaid expansion and the Affordable Care Act. One last note, that was all I had written, but uh, I actually just came back from Cincinnati Children's at 5 o'clock this morning and took a nap, came here to speak. She was admitted last night with pneumonia, um, which is being covered by Medicaid, thank the Lord. Um, So thank you, Senator Sanders, for your tenacity and your relentlessness and always fighting the good fight. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. So, I appreciate so much Zach being here, and especially appreciate the fact that he was with your daughter last night. Um, it's not easy to do what he does. You know, it's not easy to get up and talk about something very, very personal. But the truth is that Zach's story is the story of many, many people throughout this country in one form or another. This is a struggling family not making a whole lot of money uh, that has serious health care needs in the family. How do they survive with dignity? That's the issue that Zach raised, and that's the issue that I hope we will discuss. But, Zach, thanks so much uh, for being with us. Uh, Drew Carter is an alumnus of uh, Shawnee State, uh, and he has a kind of uh, maybe a little bit different story to tell, but it's a story also that impacts uh, and is a story being told by uh, millions of people. Drew, please. Good morning, beautiful people. Good morning. I haven't passed out yet. <laughs> um, I got the phone call. They asked me to speak here tonight. I said, you sure you want me to speak here tonight? All right. But I'm going to uh, share my experience with you all. Um, Many of us hear the word poverty. We think about little black babies in Africa with flies on their face. We don't think about the little black, white, brown, and Native American babies right here in the United States. Do you know what it's like walking to school and passing your aunts while they're selling their bodies for crack? To walk around the corner and see blood stains on the pavement from your uncle who was just shot seven times. Do you know what it's like to be 14 years old Stopped and frisk because you fit the description every other week. Do you know what it's like to cry many tears because drug addiction is catching up to all of your peers? Walking into a courthouse and all the, the only people there who look like you are the ones being convicted? Do you know what it's like 
to hear your mother cry in the middle of the night because the world is beating her down and daddy is nowhere to be found. She was a strong woman, strong, beautiful black woman, single parent of five, trying to teach us everything she never learned as a kid. Humbled in a homeless shelter, but we're still smiling. In high school, I was blessed to have Brent Calvin, who taught me how to become a businessman. In college, here at Shawnee State, it was mentors like the late Matt Matthews, who showed me how to be a leader. Grateful to have wonderful women like Mary Ann Malone, who encouraged me to stay in college when I was ready to give up. My heart was with my grandmother, who would give people her last that she never even knew. She showed me that the world was bigger than me and you. Do you know what it's like to live in a hopeless city where corruption and drugs run rampant? Watching the same kids you grew old with become zombies in the streets. A place where brilliant ideals will probably end up in a cemetery due to an OD. Regardless of all the hunger pains and migraines, I was able to sustain, and you can too. I believe in my people, even when they don't believe in themselves. I love my people, even when they don't love me. I'm willing to step out on that limb and be the change that we all want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you uh, very much for raising uh, about a million questions, which I hope we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, Don Surley is a local uh, union leader. Uh, Dan, please come on up. Hello, my name is Dan Shirey, and I'm privileged to say that I'm a union electrician. I'm a 20-year member. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a 20-year member of the International Brotherhood of Electric Workers, Local Union 575, right here in Portsmouth, Ohio. Sadly, I've witnessed firsthand the decline of labor unions, which equate to the decline of working conditions, wages, benefits, and the near extinction of the middle class. Personally, if not for organized labor, I'm sure I wouldn't be here speaking today. But I was fortunate enough to follow my father's advice and apply to the IBEW Local Union 575's apprenticeship program and was ultimately accepted. I was able to earn while I learned. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Missed my spot here, sorry. <laughs> and become a journeyman wireman. Through this dignified career, I've been able to provide for my family and be a productive member of society. Although I didn't know it at the time, as a young child, we, we lived in poverty. That was until my father joined IBW 575 and my mother joined OPC Local 376 and become union members. By working under a collective bargaining agreement, they were able to provide a a better way of life for my brother and I. It is with that collective voice of our labor unions that allows workers to rise up out of poverty, to be compensated with a fair wage, with health insurance, and the hope of a dignified retirement. Labor unions set the standard for all workers, whether you're a union member or not. Without organized labor, we would not have weekends. We wouldn't have breaks at work, including a lunch break. We wouldn't have Social Security, Medicare, minimum wage, eight-hour work day, the 40-hour work week, overtime pay, sick pay, holiday pay, child labor laws, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, 
health insurance, pensions and retirement plans, workplace safety laws, discrimination protections. The list goes on and on, but they told me I had to keep it to 450 words or less. <laughs> Friends, we're in the middle of class warfare, and we've been getting our asses kicked for over 30 years now. With right to work for less laws, the repeal of prevailing wage, privatizing, outsourcing, all these actions by corporate greed mongers who have bought legislatures are designed to break unions and the middle class. The income equality gap has widened to the point that either we will stand up and fight back or we will all fall in that gap. It is time we band together and stop the attack on workers from the 1% so that we all have a chance at the American dream. United we bargain, divided we beg. In closing, I want to leave you with this one final thought. The middle class built this country and labor unions built the middle class. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, and, and thanks again to everybody uh, who spoke. The reason uh, I am here today in southern Ohio is that I fully understand that Donald Trump won this county by some two-thirds, some 65 percent of the vote. Yesterday, I was in Indianapolis with a lot of trade unionists, as a matter of fact, um, in a state that Trump also won and is the home of the Vice President of the United States. And tonight, I'm going to be in Detroit, Michigan, in a city where Democrats win overwhelmingly. So why am I here? I am here because I am an old-fashioned guy who really does not believe in red states and blue states. I believe that the issues raised here by this wonderful panel are exactly the same issues that are being raised in democratic communities all over America. And I think it is high time we focused on the most important issues facing our country and do not allow people to divide us up based on the color of our skin, our sexual orientation. We have to be smarter than that. And I think what you just heard from six speakers, local people all, the issues that they have raised are the issues that are the issues of America. Let me just talk a little bit about it. Dan, let me pick up from what Dan talked about. Dan talked about the decline of the American middle class. What everybody here should know is that we live in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, but increasingly, almost all of the new income and wealth being created is not going to the people on this panel not going to Dan's co-workers, but is going to the top 1%. Now, you don't see much of this on TV. You don't read about it too much in, in the newspapers. But the top one-tenth of 1%, one percent, not 1%, one percent, one-tenth of 1%, one percent, now owns as much wealth as the bottom 90%. In America today, the 20 wealthiest people, 20 people, the front row here, own as much wealth as the bottom half of the people in this country. In fact, one person, one family, Walton family, owns as much wealth as the bottom 42% of the American people. Now, while in your county, 
Here and in my state of Vermont, it is absolutely not uncommon for people to be working two or three jobs. You have families where mom's working, dad's working, and the children are working. 52% of all new income is going to the top 1%. And over the last several decades, there has been a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class, again, to the top 1%. In fact, in the last 17 years, we have seen a tenfold increase in the number of billionaires in America, while 43 million people live in poverty. So all of that and everything that everybody has talked about up here raises a very simple question, whether you voted for Trump you voted for me, you voted for Clinton, whoever you may have voted for, what kind of nation do you want to live in? Are you satisfied living in a nation in which so few have so much and so many have so little? All right, so that is, that is the first question I think we have to put on the table. And that is the issue of social and economic justice. Should we be living in a nation in which the very, very rich get richer and we have children in America who go hungry every single day? All right, that's issue number one. Now, well, issue number two deals with a philosophical perspective. Now, let me tell you where I come from and let me tell you where I believe people who disagree with me come from. And there are people in this room who I'm sure will hold both points of view. I happen to believe that as human beings and as Americans, we are entitled to certain rights. Now, we have a great constitution. We have a bill of rights. We have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, a whole lot of freedoms that the founders of this country said that we as Americans have a right to. I would add to those rights that the American people also are entitled to certain economic rights. And at the top of that list to me is the right to health care, whether you're rich or poor, old or young. Right now, as all of you know, we have a number of federal uh, health programs that are doing very good jobs. Uh, we did not talk about Medicare, but Medicare is a very popular uh, health, public health insurance program which guarantees good quality health care to people who are 65 years of age or older. I happen to believe that we should expand Medicare to cover every man, woman, and child in this country. And I want you all, and again, this is not a radical idea. You know, often I'm being criticized, this is just such a radical idea. Please do not forget every other major country not just Canada, you go to Germany, the United Kingdom, France, Scandinavia, every major country on earth has reached the determination that if you are a human being, rich, poor, black, white, Latino, whatever you are, health care is a right, and I believe that if every other major country on earth can do it, truly the great United States of America can do that as well. Number two, as a right, we are in a wonderful state university. We live in a competitive global economy. And in order for our people to get the new good paying jobs that are out there, they're going to need a very, very good education. We have got to ask ourselves, therefore, whether in the year 2017, when we consider free public education, kindergarten through 12th grade 
is enough. And I would argue that with a changing world and changing technologies and changing jobs that require more and more education and more sophisticated education, we need to make public colleges and universities tuition free. So just think about those two ideas. Think about what it means to this country if when you get sick, you don't have to worry whether or not you can afford to go to the doctor. Do you know that there are many, many millions of people who when they get sick cannot afford to go to the doctor? And what do you think happens to them when they don't go to the doctor? They get sicker. They end up in the emergency room. They end up in the hospital a great cost to the system. And by the way, if you talk to your local physician, they will tell you that they have seen people walk into their office much sicker than they should have been. And the doctor says, well, why didn't you come in six months ago when you first noticed your symptom? And then the person says, well, I don't have any health insurance. I couldn't afford the deductible. Couldn't afford the copayment. Some of those people die. Thousands of people in America every single year die unnecessarily because they don't get to the doctor when they should. So think about what it means to America not to have to worry, to be able to walk into a doctor's office, go to a hospital, and understand that you don't have to worry about paying that bill. And by the way, people say, well, that's really expensive. Well, it's not as expensive as the current dysfunctional system, which cost us almost $10,000 per person. <clears throat> It is not as expensive as the current system, which charges us by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Because right now, uniquely in America, we are the only country on earth where you can walk into your pharmacy tomorrow and the pharmacist says, well, I'm really sorry, price of your medicine has doubled. Why is it doubled? I don't know. The company can make more money. And we have seen that in recent years. Cost of medicine doubling, tripling. We pay double, triple what many other countries around the world pay for exactly the same exact prescription drugs. And the reason for that is there is no legislation on the books today that prevents a company from charging any price the market will bear. And that is why we need very strong legislation to take on the greed of the pharmaceutical industry and lower the cost of prescription drugs. Now, is this a issue of relevance to Democrats? Yeah. Is it an issue of relevance to Republicans? Yeah. To Trump supporters? Yeah. To independents? Yeah. This is an issue that we have got to come together around. What about education? Again, right now, I was, I was at a meeting in uh, Burlington, Vermont, a couple of years ago, and we were talking about the high cost of college, and a young woman came forward, and she said, well, I recently graduated uh, medical school, and she's practicing in a community health center in Burlington, and uh, she said, I graduated school $300,000 in debt. Now, I thought that was the craziest thing I'd ever heard of, except I went to Iowa and I saw a young dental student, somebody who graduated dental school. She was $400,000 in debt. And many young people all over this country are leaving school forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in debt. And if you cannot find a decent paying job, you're going to be struggling with that debt for decades. And in fact, the principal may go up when you have high interest rates. I don't think it is too much to say in this great country that we want our young people to get the best <clears throat> education they should. That's good for themselves. That's good for the economy. We should not be punishing people with years of debt because they went out and got the education that they need. <clears throat> Now, 
Almost everybody up here has talked uh, at least about jobs. Good news now is that for the last year, we have been creating a decent amount of jobs. Unemployment is still too high, but it's lower than it was uh, seven or eight years ago after the Wall Street crash. But the problem remains that millions of Americans today are working at jobs, but they are jobs that do not pay us a living wage. Does anybody here think you can make it on the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour? And you can't make it on 9 bucks an hour? You can't make it on 11 bucks an hour. And that is why, as a nation, and again, I don't think this is a radical idea. As a nation, in my view, we should be saying to somebody that if you work 40 hours a week or longer, you should not be living in poverty. We've got to raise the minimum wage. <laughs> got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, and in my view, that is $15 an hour. And when we talk about wages, I would hope that all of us, whether we are Republicans, Democrats, or independents, would understand that in the year 2017, women should not be earning 80 cents on the dollar compared to men. Drew, when he spoke, touched on another whole issue, just touched on it, and that is a very broken criminal justice system. Now, not a whole lot of people know this, but in our country, in America, we have more people in jail than any other major country on earth. So I want you to think about how it happens that China a communist authoritarian country, four times our size, has fewer people in jail than we do. And the people in jail in the United States are disproportionately African American, Latino, and Native Americans. We are spending, as a nation, $80 billion a year locking people up at the local, state, and federal level. I would suspect that most of us understand that spending $80 billion a year to lock up fellow, our fellow Americans is not a smart thing to do, and that maybe it would make a lot more sense to be investing in our young people in terms of jobs and education rather than more jails. So those are just, just a few of the issues. Climate change is out there. Now, the President thinks that climate change is a hoax. The President is dead wrong. And on this issue, what we are fighting for is the future, not just of the United States, but of the entire planet. Now, I've got seven grandchildren, and I want to do everything that I can to make sure that the planet we leave to those kids and their kids is a planet which is healthy and habitable, and in order to do that, we're going to have to take on the huge amounts of money from the fossil fuel industry and transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. And then there's another issue. I mean, you see, once you get going on these things, we can spend hours on each and every one of these issues. But let me throw another issue out there. And that is, as you all know, throughout our history, millions of men and women have stood up, stood up 
and fought, and many of them have died in defense of American democracy. Democracy. Democracy is a very radical idea, and it's a fairly new idea to world civilization. It wasn't so long ago when you had kings and queens and czars with all of the power. They said, there's a war. I am the czar. You're going to war. I am the king. You're paying this in taxes. You have no power. I have all of the power. That is not an ancient idea that has existed in recent history. But brave people in our country and around the world stood up and said, no, we believe in democracy. Power rests with people, not just kings and queens. But what has happened over the years is there has been a massive effort in this country to weaken our democracy. What does that mean? What it means is that as a result of a very bad Supreme Court decision called Citizens United, the court ruled by a five to four decision that the wealthiest people in this country and large corporations could spend as much money as they wanted on elections. So you get one vote but the Koch brothers, a billionaire family, can spend hundreds of millions of dollars. So what we are seeing is a political process which is controlled by people who have incredible sums of money. And then recently, we have seen something else which upsets me very, very much. And that is this effort toward voter suppression. Let me say a word about that. I have run for office many, many times in my own state of Vermont, and I've lost and I've won. But it has never occurred to me, nor has I, do I think it has occurred to most elected officials that you sit around and you say, okay, in that part of the state, I'm going to do poorly. So how do I work and figure out a way to prevent those people, maybe they're black, maybe they're Latino, maybe they're poor, how do I prevent them from participating in the political process? never occurred to me. What occurred to me is to figure out a way I could win their votes, and maybe I can't. They're going to vote against me. That's all right. But right now, you have a massive effort to make it harder for people of color, for poor people, for old people, for young people in some states to participate in the political process. How do we deal with that? Well, in my state and other states, there is a good movement, I think, which says that if you're 18 years of age in the United States of America, you are automatically registered to vote. So in terms of democracy, we have one of the lower voter turnouts of other major countries. There was just a an election a few months ago in the UK, they had about 70% of their people voting. We had 60% in our presidential election. Our job is to increase voter turnout, get more people at every level involved in the political process, not make it harder for people to vote or get involved. All right, those are just some of the issues that are out there. There are more that are perhaps on your mind. Uh, let me get back to one issue. And I want to involve the panel uh, if they so choose um, to participate. They didn't know they were going to be asked this question, but <laughs> let me do it. Um, how serious is the drug problem uh, here in southern Ohio? Uh, why are people turning to drugs? Uh, what do you think we can do to address the problem? That's my first question. Anybody up here wants to respond? Yeah. Dan? I've always thought that... Dan, grab that mic, Dan. I've always thought that the, you know, the economic problems here uh, you know, played a big factor into the, the opioid crisis. You know, I, I, you know, I feel that maybe there's a sense of hopelessness um, as far as how to fix it, I mean, you know, we've, we got some good people trying to bring some, you know, some new uh, industry in and, and help with some good jobs, but that's, you know, that's my feelings okay. on the opioid well, problem. Dan raises 
I tend to agree with Dan, and I think there's a lot of evidence um, that what, what some physicians, some scientists refer to uh, addiction as a disease of despair, is that uh, when people kind of give up and they're going nowhere with their lives, perhaps their kids have no opportunities, then they succumb to drugs and, and, and alcohol. Uh, other thoughts? Uh, just jump right in. Well, one of the ways that we're addressing it here in our community at our federally qualified health center, as you mentioned, um, we focus on partnerships and we focus on integration. So finding other agencies, other organizations in our community to work together so that when someone's coming in for a health care need, you're really looking at the full package. You're really looking at not do they just have a cold or are their diabetes uncontrolled? What are some of the underlying issues? Um, might it be substance abuse? As Lisa mentioned earlier, might maybe it's a mental health um, illness as well. So we really have to work as a community on this epidemic and on chronic conditions. All of it comes together and through working together and through focusing on that integrated approach, we can get people healthier. We can get them back in the workforce. We can get them back on track to get back to school. Okay. Uh Lisa, did you want to say a word on that, your, your sense of where we are, how serious the problem is, and where we might want to go? Grab that mic there, if you could, please. Well. Hold it to your mouth. Yeah. I would agree with Summer on that, and I think that uh, we, we were talking just a couple of weeks ago on uh, the uh, mental health issues that contribute in, in the way of... Um, maybe abuse issues, uh, depression, um, anxiety, actually even parenting skills as far as those things go. Um, but again, economically, if, if, the, um, if the jobs aren't out there, the education isn't available, um, then I think that it does lead to despair. All right, let me ask the audience, uh, how many of you know people who in one way or another are struggling with drugs or alcohol? Whoa, my God. Whoa. Okay. Um, um, this just speaks to the seriousness of the problem. Anyone want to just jump up, be as loud as you can, and talk about what you think the problem might be? Yes, ma'am. Be as loud as you can, please. You know what we're going to do? Uh, you got that mic? Mic? Yeah, why don't we get this? Oh, you got a mic? Good. Okay. My name is Brooke. Um, I'm a student at Shawnee. I have been reading a book called Dreamland. Um, it's a true tale of the drug opiate problem, and it's actually based in Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, it starts with doctors pushing pills and prescription pills onto us as workers of the union that have pain issues. And it kind of goes on from there, but there is a small picture with the community and there's a larger picture with Big Pharma um, that pushes the pills onto us. And then, of course, there is the economy problem. So. Okay. Thank you. No question, in my mind at least, that uh, a lot of doctors did not fully understand the consequences of some of the opioids uh, that they were prescribing. Uh, who has other thoughts on the issue? Stand up if you want to. Yeah, right here. Can we get that mic to that uh, young man right there? Thank you, thank you. A little bit of my background. My name is Devin Applegate. Uh, my father actually overdosed uh, in 2008. My mother has uh, struggled with uh, heroin addiction a lot recently, and uh, my thoughts on that is I feel like whenever, you know, they had me and my sister and they, a lot of struggles, you know, whether it be not getting a job, neither of them had a job, they, that's whenever apparently they started really getting into the drug scene and it really hit them hard and they uh, just, you know, they were down on life, they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, it's, they just completely had a sense of hopelessness. Uh, she started getting, I know my mom, on uh, depression, you know, 
pills and then everything just keeps escalating from there. And then, uh, you know, my father, he, they, they both decided that they didn't want to take care of us anymore. So my, grandparent, my grandparents, thankfully, started taking care of us. But uh, after that, you know, they just basically, once they didn't have us, they actually got into a more depressed state. And then once they were already in the, you know, the fuel, you know, it just fueled from there the whole drug state, and it didn't help. And once they didn't have us, they had no hope. They just felt like, you know, there's no sense of living anymore. And once you're, you've already succumbed to the drugs, you basically, you know, it's a, just the flame keeps growing. And uh, once, you know, they feel like there's no hope around, then there's not much you can do from there. And it, you know, can't really get out of it until you, know, you either die or hopefully get help, but that really happens around here. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for... Okay. I want to move on to some... Uh, all right. Yeah, there's a hand over there. Let's do one more because I want to move on to some other issues. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, uh, my name's Joe. It's a little embarrassing, so I'll just be honest. Uh, I went to school twice. I went to college twice. Once at Ohio State. Once at Shawnee. Uh, I dropped out both times because I had serious clinical depression. I've been in and out of mental hospitals. I uh, did my fair share of drugs and alcohol in college. Uh, I'm fine now, but uh, I'm still 30,000 in debt, which is pretty awful. Um, but my sister, she has a similar situation. She lives in Cleveland, and she got addicted to prescription pills. And she would drive four hours from Cleveland just to get pills in Portsmouth. And that wasn't on the street. That was from a doctor because she could just list a couple symptoms and then just give her whatever she wanted. She'd call Dr. Feelgood, say, oh, I gotta go down to Portsmouth, uh, I need some more pills. She'd to say anything, they just give it to her. So, I don't know what the problem is with drugs, but that's just my personal experience. She didn't get them from some drug dealer, she got them from a doctor, so. Okay. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Look, I think, let me thank the people in the audience who uh, have spoken up publicly about tough issues for themselves and their families. Nobody here has a magical solution to the problem. But I think the fundamental question that we have got to ask ourselves is how does and what's going on in America? And again, nobody, I'm not here to blame anybody. Nobody has any magical answers. What is going on in our country where so many people see solace in drugs and addiction when many of them know that the only things that happen with heroin and, and dependency on opiates are death or jail. And yet, all over this country, we're seeing more and more people uh, getting addicted. So that's an issue we have got to deal with. I agree with Dan. I think it has a lot, uh, and Joe, I think, made the point. It has a lot to do with hopelessness, with lack of community, uh, with um, you know people feeling isolated and alone and going nowhere in a hurry. Tough issues, but it's an issue we're not going to solve unless we uh, unless we put it on the table. All right, let me talk, uh, let me just open the issue, the question of um, education. Uh, what does it mean to leave school $30,000 in debt? What does it mean if you're a bright young person uh, unable uh, to go to college because you can't afford uh, to go? What does it mean if you want to be a plumber or an electrician but you don't have the capability or the money to get the training that you need. Who wants to talk about that issue? Okay, yep, be loud. Can we get that woman a mic, please? Where's the mic? Senator Sanders, my name is Casey Light. Hold it. Casey, hang on for one second. Is a mic. Mic coming. Hi, Senator. My name is Casey Leitenheimer. I was privileged to vote for you in the Ohio primary with my infant daughter, Strap. last year or so of my employment um, teaching here at the university as an adjunct professor. I've also worked with first-generation college students, uh, potential first-generation college students, who struggle with things like um, economic disadvantages, social, social disadvantages. They don't have family members who have that experience to help them get that leg up into university. And at this very moment, we are waiting on word from Donald Trump's Department of Education on whether or not our grant is worthy of being refunded. <laughs> like literally, right this minute. If it is to be canceled, over 100 students in our vicinity, which holds 
the poorest public school in the state of Ohio will not have that lifeline any longer. And I just struggle with what to tell them if that does become the case. I don't know how they can keep hope throughout the next four years, hopefully just four years. Um, that's what I have to say about that. Thank the, you. The poverty locally has, has, put, has made education something that's a privilege rather than something that's a right. And I don't really know how to proceed with that. So. Okay. Okay, we got a young man there. Hello, uh, my name is Martel Moore. I'm a student here at Shawnee State. And I'm actually from Cincinnati, and I went to the public schools there, which is actually the best um, urban school district in the uh, state. But my whole entire uh, high school experience, I went to two high schools. I went to one named Walnut Hills, which is actually the best high school in the state of Ohio. But I then transferred to another school named Withrow, which is like not even close to being on the level that one was. And what I saw with the difference was the kids who had like enough knowledge who were like um, knowledgeable, knowledgeable enough to actually go to college, they sh just couldn't go because either their parents couldn't afford it, they couldn't file a FAFSA, or they just, just didn't know how they were going to be able to pay it off if they actually went to school. And now I'm in school now, and my sister's actually in medical school. And she's told me she just, is just willing to pay back all the money that she's going to owe after she gets out. And I'm going to have to pay back thousands of dollars that I had to take out on a loan just to go here. And I might not even be able to get certain grants anymore next year because my dad got a promotion at a job. So now he makes just enough money so I don't qualify for certain grants. And I just honestly think that I know that a lot of kids, like my roommate, for example, who doesn't know how he's going to pay $3,000 to a university so he can get a job that he might not get after he graduates. And he might not be able to afford, you know, to pay back just to go to school. Which, honestly, I, I see now so the prior, part of the reason a lot of kids don't go to college. You know? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. All right. So the question, and you know, this gets back to, let me veer a little bit to politics. I don't want to make this into a political meeting. But the issue here is, you know, there are some people out there, there's an ideology out there which is kind of being pushed by the Koch brothers, a very, very wealthy, extremely right-wing family. And, and this is their ideology. And it's not a crazy ideology, but this is their view. And their view is that government in society should pay, play a virtually, play a very, very limited role. And that what freedom means is having government not involved in Social Security. They don't want to cut Social Security. They want to eliminate Social Security, eliminate Medicare, eliminate Medicaid. And essentially their view is that every human being is on their own. You want to go to college, you want to go to graduate school, no problem. You figure out a way to pay for it government should play no role. And if you are 80 years of old and you are ill and you're dealing with a heart disease, don't expect the government to be there for Medicare. You figure out a way to pay your health care bills. And that is an ideology which says basically everybody is on their own. I have no responsibility to you or your family. You have no responsibility to me or my family. And that is roughly the ideology that is growing within the Republican Party. That's how they could cut, throw 32, or propose to throw 32 million people off of health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. That's the ideology. I don't have a moral responsibility to be concerned about you. You're not supposed to be concerned about me. Is that a good ideology? Is that one we are comfortable? Who wants to speak? Is there anybody here? And I don't mean to... You know, my, my conservative friends can do a better job defending that ideology than I can. But somebody defend that ideology. Why should I have to pay taxes to send that young man to college? Why don't I just have the right to worry about my family? Who wants to talk to that issue? All right? A lot of people who aren't willing to pay their taxes pay extra taxes to help fund people like my friend Martel get through college, 
Um, they're looking at it like somebody's getting something for free when they should be looking at it like they're funding the future of the United States as a whole and as of the population. <laughs> See, I agree with you. What's your name? Ethan. Ethan. It's a good Vermont name, Ethan. <laughs> uh, I agree with you, but that, what that suggests is that you believe that we are a nation and that we should be concerned about all of us. All right? Now, I share that belief, and I think most Americans share that belief. But the other point of view is, I got to worry about myself. I got to worry about my family. And you know what? You're a nice guy. I don't want to worry about you. I don't want to pay any taxes for you to go to school or for you to get health care. Now, I think that's a minority point of view, but it is a point of view which is uh, growing. Uh, let me uh, get to um, is there anything up here? Any of the panelists want to raise issues? Drew, anything on your mind that uh, hasn't been discussed? Mike check is this one. First, I'd like to thank the young lady in the back, the teacher here. Um, when I was at Shawnee State, I went through the program with Mary Ann Malone, and that was one of the reasons why I graduated from Shawnee State University. <clears throat> so thank you for your hard work. Keep fighting the good fight. And I'm a little I'm not the brightest person up here on this panel. I'm not. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, got a, I have a question and comment. We have a heroin problem here in southeastern Ohio. And I worked in the chemical dependency field for about five years. I worked with hundreds of addicts. I've known a lot of drug dealers, many of them who have been arrested and spent time in prison. One thing I noticed about these people, you know, they never... A lot of them didn't have education and whatnot, but they never had, like, passports, and they never owned boats and planes. And if I'm not mistaken, the opiate comes from the poppy seed, correct? Am I, am I correct? All right. So we always talking about we want to stop the drug problem here. You know, we have such a bad problem. And, and I'm thinking to myself, like, well, these people that's getting locked up, coming in and out of jail, dying, most of these people never even left this area, or they might have went to Myrtle Beach for vacation when they were kids. So who's bringing the op who's bringing the drugs here? Because these aren't the people they don't they don't have passports. These are poor people that's getting arrested, that's going to jail. That's what I want to know. You know, I'm tired. Of, we got all these uh, rehab facilities popping up all around the nation, all around this area. Everybody's eating off of it. Everyone's getting paid. People in and out of jail, and it's just a bunch of poor people. Poor black, poor white, poor Hispanic. In and out of these jails around here. And it's sad, and, and it hurt, and it breaks my heart. And, it, and, it, and, it's, and like, they keep hearing people talk about the same thing every year, over and over. And I'm like, get to the point. Who's bringing the drugs here? That's what I want to know. I think what we know is that the drug cartels are multi, multi billion dollar businesses. They are enormously sophisticated businesses. They have uh, control of a lot of politicians around the world. Uh, in Mexico, for example, it is an enormously a serious problem. If you have a cartel worth billions of dollars, you can bribe a lot of people and you can do the things that you have to do, and it's true not only in Mexico. So I think we have to deal with the issue of how the drugs are coming into this country, but we also cannot ignore the reality of why it is that so many people feel that they need those drugs. So I think those are the two areas that we have to focus on. All right, uh, you have been a great um, audience here. I don't want to keep you uh, too much longer. Let me just maybe conclude by saying this. Again, I am in Trump country because I think the issues that you face here in southern Ohio, not any different than in Vermont, not any different than in California, 
or any other state in this nation. I think at the end of the day, in my view, we have got to say to the wealthiest and most powerful people in this country, and again, this is a difficult issue, and people feel uncomfortable in terms of dealing with it, but we have got to say to the 1% and the billionaire class that they cannot have it all, that we need an economy Now, right now, Congress is on recess. When I get back, in all likelihood, the major legislation that will be on the floor of the Senate or in committee will be so-called tax reform. Does anybody know what that so-called tax reform is really about? What it will be about are massive tax breaks for the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations. So I think, as a nation, you know, we have got to have an agenda which says that if you are a billionaire, you're going to start paying your fair share of taxes. <laughs> that if you are a large multinational corporation, you are not going to be able to continue with impunity throwing American workers out on the street and moving to Mexico or China. You know, I was just in Indiana yesterday, and the head of United Technologies, a corporation that is very, very profitable, a couple of years ago, the CEO who resigned got a $172 million golden parachute. When he left, they gave him $172 million, and then that company said, oh, we don't have enough money to pay workers in Indiana a decent wage. We have to move to Monterey, Mexico. We'll pay people three bucks an hour. All right, so those are the issues that we have got to deal with. How do you create a vibrant economy, decent jobs, decent wages, pay equity for women? How do we create an educational system from child care to graduate school, which means that the young people have quality care regardless of their income of their families? How do we create a health care system that guarantees health care to all people? How do we transform our energy system so we do not destroy the planet? How do we create a vibrant democracy so that billionaires do not control the political process? Those are some of the issues that are out there. And let me end by saying this. I believe that when people of all walks of life young people, working people, lower income people, begin to get involved in the political process, begin to run for school board or city council or state legislature, when people begin to stand up and tell the truth, and you heard a lot of truth here today, not, not easy truth, painful truth, you heard it from some of our speakers. When we have the guts to talk about what goes on in our lives, in our families' lives, when we bring people together around rational solutions to those problems, when we do that, the truth is that in this country, there is nothing, nothing that we cannot accomplish. Thank you all very much.